you have your Bibles this morning, please turn in the Old Testament to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Our scripture text for today's message is taken from verses 1 through 17. Would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word? Beginning with verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to, th uh, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and held it. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. You may be seated as we pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for giving us life. Thank you for blessing us so greatly. Thank you for granting us the opportunity to assemble here this morning. Father, we ask that you will open our hearts and minds to your truth. And if necessary, take us out of our comfort zones in order to teach us. And Father, I humbly ask that you will hide me behind the cross so this congregation sees only you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> On May the 10th, 1987, ABC newsman Ted Koppel delivered the commencement address at Duke University. Mr. Koppel's speech contained the following, and I quote, What Moses brought down from Mount Sinai were not the ten suggestions. They are commandments. Are, not were. The sheer brilliance of the ten commandments is that they codify in a handful of words acceptable human behavior, not just for them, or now, but for all time, end of quote. Sadly, the Ten Commandments are often treated as suggestions. Also, some professing Christians believe that they were nailed to the cross and as a result are no longer valid. As believers, it is most important for us to remember that the Ten Commandments are as relevant today as they were when God gave them to Moses. In his book entitled, Gleanings in Exodus, Arthur Benning wrote the following. The Ten Commandments have never been repealed. The very fact that they were written by the finger of God himself, written not upon parchment, but on tablets of stone, argues conclusively their permanent nature. 
If it was contrary to the mind of God that those living during the Christian dispensation should regard the Ten Commandments as binding upon them, then surely he would have said so in plain language. But the New Testament will be searched in vain for a single word which announces their cancellation. Commandments 1 through 4 deal with man's relationship to God. Commandments 5 through 10 deal with man's relationship to man. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. God chose the people of Israel to be a nation for himself. He asserted his authority to enact his law. The people owed their service to him because they owed their freedom to him. Only divine power could have delivered them from Egyptian slavery. Consider God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. Then he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. These words clearly show that God foreordained the slavery and the deliverance of the people of Israel. In so doing, God was glorified. Now, let's look at verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. The first commandment. And friends, it is appropriate that this commandment be first. We are to have no other gods in our lives, period. The Lord God Almighty is our creator, sustainer, and redeemer. All honor, praise, and allegiance belong to him. Although the forces of evil can be deceptive, let us remember that there are no other gods who exist of themselves in their own power. The only other gods are those created by human beings. These gods include Satan, other human beings, objects, and status. The one true God gives us peace, a false god can leave us in despair. If we totally obey the first commandment, we should have no difficulty with the other nine. Verses four through six. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. We are forbidden to make idols for the worship of the Lord God Almighty. In the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verse 24, we find these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Therefore, it is not possible for any human being to make an accurate image of God. But by making any such object, we seek to define and control God. It could possibly be said that in so doing, we're trying to make God in our image. Also, we're forbidden to make idols for the worship of other gods. Since we were to have no other gods, we would also be breaking the first command. Today, idol worship can be so. For example, we break this commandment 
when we place various objects in a church sanctuary, such as uh, Christmas trees, paintings, statues representing the Lord Jesus Christ. All of these are violations. A warning and a promise are attached to this commandment. As a natural consequence, children would experience the impact of the sins of their parents' generation. On the other hand, God will show mercy to those who honor him. Verse 7, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Not only does this commandment impose a strict prohibition, it also speaks of God's judgment for violation. We serve a holy God whose holiness sets him apart from his creation. As created beings, we have no right to disrespect our creator. In ordinary conversation and in worship, we must always lift his name high. We are warned that breaking this commandment has consequences. Consider the words of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now let's look at verses 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and how the Sabbath day is a gift from God, a day to rest following six days of labor. In the Gospel of Mark chapter 2, verse 27, the Lord Jesus Christ said, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. This commandment does not refer to the Sabbath as the seventh day of the week. Nor are we instructed to observe the Sabbath on Saturday. As Christians, we observe the Sabbath on Sunday, the first day of the week, which is the Lord's Day. The risen Christ appeared to his followers on the first day of the week. Also, the Apostle John's vision on the Isle of Patmos occurred on the Lord's Day. We should honor God by resting from work and by worship on the Sabbath day. Verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. God created the family unit. In order to have a state of society, parents must be obeyed and respected. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, the apostle Paul wrote the following, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children are to obey their parents as if obeying the Lord himself. Consider the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ as a human boy in the Gospel of Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Then he went down with them, them meaning his earthly parents, and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. Obviously, obedience is part of this commandment, but the word honor means more than obey. To honor parents is to give them the place of superiority and to hold them in high esteem. The attached promise to this commandment primarily related to life in the promised land. We see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, the Apostle Paul applied this truth to believers in his day. Verse 13, you 
shall not murder. Only God can create life. Only God can raise the dead. Because human life is sacred, God attached the death penalty to murder. Consider Genesis chapter 9, verse 6. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ showed that murder is not limited to the physical act, but also pertains to one's state of mind. Consider the words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. We are cautioned to control the sinful motives of anger and hatred, which can lead to murder. Verse 14, you shall not commit adultery. God ordained marriage to be a union between one man and one woman for the remainder of their natural lives. Adulterous relationships damage and destroy marriages. The Lord Jesus Christ showed that unfaithfulness is not limited to the physical act, but includes the passions behind the act. Consider the words from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 27 and 28. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Again, we're cautioned to control sinful thoughts and emotions which can lead to destructive acts. Verse 15, you shall not steal. When we consider the meaning of the word stealing, we often think about the physical seizing of a person's property by stale, force, or violence. While these activities occur frequently, there are also other forms of stealing. Some examples are as follows. Borrowing an item and failing to return it. Misrepresenting an article for sale in order to obtain a higher price for it. Withholding just debts, rents, and wages. And I'm sure there are others. The purpose of this commandment is to instill honesty in all our dealings with others. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The most flagrant violation of this commandment is to slander a neighbor by inventing and circulating a lie with malicious intent. Also, it is possible to bear false witness through a mere hint or suggestion. In our courts, justice cannot be served by untruthful testimony. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 19 tells us that a false witness who speaks lies is an abomination to the Lord. Verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant nor his office, nor his donkey, nor anything that is in the neighbors. The other nine commandments prohibit <coughs> over acts. This commandment forbids the appetites and desires, which are the beginning of all sin. Consider the words from the epistle of James, chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. 
then the desire has been seen, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. In considering the Ten Commandments, let us remember that the law of God is perfect, but we are not. The law cannot save us because as fallen human beings, we cannot perfectly keep them. But God did not leave us to die in our sins. Consider the words of Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. At this time of year, there's much focus on Christmas gifts. Instead, we should focus on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's gift to sinful humanity. By overcoming sin, death, and hate, our Savior has given God's people eternal life, which is the greatest gift a human being can receive. I was bound for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for granting us this opportunity to be here this morning. Father, you tell us that your word does not return void, but that it accomplishes what you send it to do. And Father, as your word has gone forth this morning, may it comfort, convict, encourage, and enlighten each person who is here. And Father, if there are those here this morning whom you are calling to salvation or to service for you, may they respond during our invitation here. We offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.